Hello, I'm Hadley Marchek from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to today's media briefing for ACS Spring 2022. The next generation of scientists and inventors are already tackling some of society's problems, like drinking water contaminated with lead. And at the ACS meeting, a group of high school students and their instructor are reporting on a faucet attachment that's able to remove this toxic metal. Unlike filters that are already in stores, theirs indicates when it's used up by turning the drinking water or tap water yellow. We're joined today by Ms. Rebecca Bushway, a science teacher at Barry Middle, Middle and Upper School, and Dr. John Kidder, the head of school for Barry School in Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. We're excited to be in this conversation. Ms. Bushway, can you tell us what inspired you and your students? So it was not long after the Flint water crisis, and I was watching TV and I saw this woman, uh, she turned on her faucet and brown water came out of her, her faucet. And she said, I don't even know if it's toxic. I don't even know if it's safe. How do I find that out? And I was thinking about it and thinking about the ways that we can tell if there's lead in water at a macroscopic level. And I was talking about it with some of my uh, upper chemistry students. And we discussed how it would be possible with, with chemistry that we already understood that I was teaching in the class that day uh, to really get at that. And so we kind of brainstormed an idea for a filter. Um, and that eventually led to where we are now. And so how many students have you had working on this project so far then? So over COVID uh, in 2020, 2020, the 2020, 2021 school year, um, I had four students. This year I have six. So ultimately we've had a total of 10 students working on this project. And so how have the, you and your students developed this filter cartridge and the system to remove lead from the water? So basically it was, it's, dependent on phosphates. And this is a process that we understood really well. It works amazingly for soil remediation. It removes lead from soil all the time. We're using calcium phosphate because it's inexpensive. It's also the same kind of stuff that's in our bones. So calcium phosphate mixes with lead and removes the lead in a bio unavailable form. And so, and it becomes a solid, a solid that doesn't break down easily. Uh, we're making it in a, uh, in a biodegradable plastic uh, filter so that at the end you'll have something that you can just toss in the in the landfill and you don't have to worry about it it's no longer toxic the thing that makes ours really different is that we're coupling it with a uh, a semi-permeable membrane that contains potassium iodide when potassium iodide reacts with lead it turns yellow and not just a little yellow like glitter yellow it's if, in the words of one of our students, if it wasn't so toxic, it would be beautiful. And so even at small concentrations, this is visible to the naked eye. Our next step is to find something that to, to build a UV vis into the filter itself. So even below the detection limits that the EPA has set, you'll be able to tell if it's in your water. But even at the 20 parts per million that the EPA says is safe, you'll be able to tell with the, the potassium iodide because you can see it in the water. If I could add to this, many science teachers think that we need to give students massive amounts of content so they have the background to eventually do something interesting. But I think the opposite is true. And I, I, I know that Rebecca Bushway feels this way, which is that when you give them content then simultaneously you give them an interesting, relevant problem to solve, that's when they roll up their sleeves to understand the chemistry because they're learning about it with their hands, they're doing something useful, they're doing their own research, their curiosity is sparked. When that happens, their knowledge goes far deeper than a textbook experience. Well, that's really interesting. And so do you have a prototype of your filter that you're able to show us? and? what this actually looks like. So this is the, the prototype filter. It was printed here in our makerspace lab. The problem, the biggest problem of the filter was not the chemistry, but of the engineering. So I envisioned something that could be fastened to a faucet or to a water bottle, and then water could be poured through it and, and then the water would be safe. 
So this is uh, only one of our now several adapters. This connects to any standard sink faucet. And so the contaminated water will come through the, the adapter and strike the diverter plate. The diverter plate will slow the flow down and it comes along these blue things that actually painted them blue uh, into the side channels where it slows the water down and so that it reacts, has plenty of time to react with the calcium phosphate. The size and the shape of it was developed with uh, help from our physics teacher because we needed to make sure that the size of the, of the reaction chamber was large enough to accommodate the, the reaction uh, dynamics. Then once it has completed that reaction time, it flows through the outflow pipe. Uh, the part at the very bottom is where the semi-permeable membrane goes. So after it has reacted with everything else, then it has an opportunity to interact with the potassium iodide. So it's not until it gets through everything else in the reaction chamber that it reaches the potassium iodide. The outflow pipe is packed with uh, glass wool to prevent anything else from coming out of it. And the great thing here is, is that the space here is for the reaction to occur. It's not necessarily completely packed with the substrate, right? It's not packed all with calcium phosphate. So other things can be added here too. For example, um, activated charcoal. And what would activated charcoal do if you added it to your filter? So in the event, for example, that you were living in Texas after uh, the power had gone out for an extended period of time, and you the only water that was available to you was uh, snow runoff, and you didn't know what else was in the water, activated charcoal and potassium iodide would be adequate to clean the water safe enough for you to drink, even if it didn't have lead in it. And so potassium iodide, I guess, also has some cleaning properties? Potassium iodide is what you put in your water uh, to clean it if you go, go camping. Oh, so it's just the same sort of packet that you would add to your water. To, yeah. to, to kill things from a biological perspective. Yes. And so what's so interesting is giving them a really complicated engineering problem allows students who might be interested in physics to pull the physics into what she's doing or biology and realize that science is really the integration of all of these different lenses. And then they got to find a way to print it. They print seven versions. They realize it's the seventh version that actually works. And what we're trying to teach, what she's trying to teach, which I think is so extraordinary, is really teaching the combination of tenacity and curiosity. And that they need to do both back and forth and then integrate all these different um, subject specialties into one project, which is what science is on, on a high level. There were 14 failed uh, just for the adapter. There were 14 failed prototypes just for the adapter. And, and teaching kids that failing is actually part of science is a really important lesson. We fail forward. I like that. I like the idea of failing forward. And so you, you said you've made a number of prototypes now and you're presenting one of them at the ACS meeting. Do you have any plans to work with a company or start manufacturing these types of filters for larger scale distribution? That is, we are at the cusp of that. We're just at that edge. That's, that's one of the reasons for the spring con conference is that we are ready to meet someone at that, at that juncture. We're ready for that point. Great. And I know one of your other teams, one of your other goals for your team was to make this relatively inexpensive so that it could easily be sent, like you were saying, somewhere to a location that was dealing with water quality troubles. Do you think you've been able to accomplish that? Uh, I priced out the, the parts and each one of these filters at market today could be produced for a dollar or less. And so that's like you're saying, including the biodegradable plastic as well as the filter materials inside as well. Yes. Okay. Can I add that the goal isn't just to do things now. It's when students have the chance to experience something when they're 16, when they're doing their postdoc at 27, and they've done a whole series of smaller projects, we don't know what the heck they're going to invent in the future. But becoming an entrepreneur or scientist takes practice. And so to some degree, this product isn't really the culmination of it. It's really the spark to start a whole series of conversations about what can we do 
it's a different take on the old expression of better living through chemistry. Exactly. So I know you've talked a little bit about the chemistry behind these filters. You talked a little bit about the design element. Can you talk more about how you brought these two together? And like you were saying, for the 3D printing um, and doing this all in your school itself. So the first year, um, I didn't have students who were really interested, chemistry students who were really interested in doing this. I knew that I had some students that were supremely bright and were capable of doing the work. They just didn't think they were. Uh, for example, I had one student who was completely convinced, well, I mean, he still is, that art was his forte. And I reached out to him to design the original filter. Uh, I had a student who is actually in college right now for marketing. And I knew that, that she absolutely knew the math that was necessary to start the work on the, uh, how big does it need to be? What's the residence time? What's the flow rate? Uh, I had another student who was really interested in social justice and I wanted to find, uh, I wanted someone to do the background research and start the literature review and be able to look at the social justice of lead and water and what it looked like in our country. And so those are the students that I reached out to that first year. Uh, and while they didn't think that they had the background in science that they needed in order to participate in the class that calls itself advanced topics in chemistry, they learned very quickly that they did. And that's the other half of this, is that chemistry doesn't have to be daunting. Chemistry doesn't have to be uh, after school on Saturdays and and have a, a test at the end. Chemistry can be practical. Chemistry can be, uh, how do you get from A to B and how does it affect me? And how can I make a meaningful difference in the world using what I know and what I'm good at? So I think that leads really well into my last question then for Dr. Kidder. Can you talk about how you think science exper experiences like the one in Ms. Bushway's classroom are really designed to help prepare this next generation of scientists or our students uh, for careers in chemistry or other STEM fields? Exactly. And I think that the lesson I take from this kind of entrepreneurial teaching is that um, the next generation of scientists really need to be cultivated. We need to mentor them. We need, as educators, to provide experiences for them to get excited because the old expression is you learn all this material and suddenly you become interested in us. That's not how it works. Every single scientist in the world, that love began with a spark. Might have been when somebody was a little kid, might have been in graduate school, but without that spark, nobody's going to spend the time to gather the knowledge that they need for any, anything deep. The goal here is to create an experiential model so that students who already see themselves as interested in STEM fields, and especially students who are very talented, but for a whole range of reasons, haven't been mentored or told that they can become scientists. We've got to hook all those students in. Now, some of them are going to become professional scientists. Some of them will be informed citizens. We need both to be able to move forward. And I think that giving teachers the kind of professional development they need to mentor that next generation, particularly coming out of a pandemic, is crucial social justice focused work. And I'm proud to have uh, Rebecca Bushway doing this work here, as are many other teachers on our campus. Well, fantastic. Thank you both so much for talking with me today and sharing with me about the excitement that you have for the science, but also it seems like the excitement that your students have for the projects that they've been working on. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Be sure to check out our other media briefings for ACS Spring 2022, which will be posted throughout the meeting at www.acs.org slash ACS Spring 2022 briefings.